Não queres fazer tu essa? Ok. Uh, vamos começar. Um, good evening. Um, we are starting now uh, one more uh, Docomobile lecture. Uh, we would like to start to thank to Rui Cunha Foundation for hosting this event. Uh, and also uh, Fundação Macau, Macau Foundation, for all the support they always give us for these uh, lectures. Uh, we like to welcome uh, all the guests here present, and Professor uh, Lawrence Lowe for the privilege of uh, having you here. Uh, I'll do just a brief introduction to, the, to Professor uh, Lawrence Lowe, that is an associate professor at the Hong Kong U, also teaching at the ICOMOS International Center in uh, Rome, as well as running his uh, uh, architectural uh, practice in his own uh, office. Uh, Lawrence was a, an a appointee by UNESCO to act as a, the on-site assessor for the World Heritage Listing of uh, Macau and uh, Kaiping, uh, China. So he is very well uh, acquainted to the, to the problematic of the heritage in, the, in Macau, I believe. Uh, along his practice, he received uh, multiple uh, awards. I will just point those that I think is more relevant. The most excellent project, uh, 2000 UNESCO Asia Pacific uh, Heritage Awards, with the restoration of the um, Chong Fat Tse Mansion. The 2008 UNESCO Award of Excellence with the restoration of Malaysia Stadium of uh, Independence. And also recently, um, uh, Professor Lawrence uh, Law received the Malaysian Institute of Architects uh, Honor, a gold medal award for his lifelong uh, contribution to the advance of architecture in Malaysia and uh, internationally. Uh, I believe that uh, during the presentation today, Professor uh, Lawrence is going to present um, his, his talk about his experience and activities in the Sink City, that is a community-led organization uh, from which uh, Professor Lawrence Law is uh, the director. And this is an organization that promotes urban regeneration based on the civil uh, society as well as the culture uh, background. So, please welcome the Professor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to sit down because the... First and foremost, I think, let me say that it's a privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, I hope to vindicate uh, who is faith in me, to be able to communicate and transfer some of the ideas to you. Um, and it's, it's about an organization called Think City. And if you look at the tagline, it says rejuvenating the city together. And I would dare say that we have actually delivered in accordance with that tagline. Um, we call it a social purpose organization. It is a company owned by Kazana National, which is the sovereign fund of Malaysia. And the present source of uh, funding comes from Yayasan Hazana, which is a foundation created by Kazana, the sovereign fund. We are, we are in four geographies. We are in Penang, Butterworth, um, Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, and in Johor Bahru, which is next to Singapore. And that these are all strategic positions that we occupy. We like to think of ourselves as a think and do tank. Uh, and it's really about running an organization that is community led. And we are specifically looking at what we call just urban regeneration. So, in fact, any project, large or small, uh, complicated or simple, 
as long as it has to do with community and urban regeneration, um, we are prepared to assist in, in the enabling of such projects. So looking at what we do, um, there are three cogs working here. We drive urban regeneration, we provide urban policy thinking, and we implement innovative urban solutions. These are the three key areas. And we have five pillars which you look at. We are committed to doing capacity building. We look at public realm improvement, space activation. Uh, we are very, very strong in looking at research and advocacy. And we look at content and culture curation, which will become evident as I go along. City is essentially a platform for collaboration, a community-led urban regeneration program that brings the various stakeholders to align in the shared vision that we can make our cities work together. We started off with giving grants for refurbishment of buildings and content providing, both in Georgetown Festival and Batu Fringe Festival. I think placemaking has changed people to take pride in the place that they live in. It helped change the physical look and fabric of the inner city, and with that also the appreciation of culture and the freedom of the arts. Makam ni adalah center di mana komuniti kami ni berjumpa. Masa tu bangunan berada dalam keadaan sangat teruk lah kerana kita. So, jadi ini betul-betul komuniti punya projek dan Think City buat bantuan dari segi teknikal dan sebagainya. The reality today is that the future lies with cities. Cities have become the pathways for prosperity and progress. Transformation in especially Georgetown is very big. To an extent, I think it was called as ghost town. Now you can see that the people are coming back, and the open spaces people are using it, plus art and culture, and also the tourists coming back. Then all this transformation really giving the economic growth to the city. A lot of things happen somewhere else, but not in the middle of the city. So this is what we are providing, just a physical space for people to work, to collaborate. Bila ada Zongshan sekarang ni, dah semakin ramai orang datang balik ke Pusat Bandar. Bila kita pindah sini, banyak benda yang berubah. Kita dapat lagi banyak customer, cash flow lagi laju. So, dia bagi motivation untuk kita untuk expand lagi kedai ni. Building ni dia creative hub. Everybody is doing something different and everybody is supporting each other. You don't work alone. Together, you can make things happen. Step up, take charge, have a sense of ownership. Everyone out there have the power in their hands to make their cities better. We work with global and local public and private organizations and our outreach is successful because we occupy what I call a sweet spot. Right? So if you look at the different pillars of delivery, we have our public grants program, we do public-private partnerships with local government and government agencies, and we set up private partnerships with corporations and global experts. Look at the, some of our partners, they're the government, they're people like Getty Conservation Institute, um, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, we have worked with PPS from New York, and a whole plethora of different people that actually form both our networks as well as our partnership. And why I say we occupy a sweet spot? Because if you look at the delivery uh, platforms that we work on, we are seen as a government agency, 
as far as the fact that we belong to the Sovereign Fund of Malaysia, which is managed by the Ministry of Finance. But most of the directors in this company are non-government employees. Our chairman is non-government, I'm non-government. Uh, I think another lady is also non-government. So there are two people employed by Kazana, and one of them comes from the, the foundation itself. So uh, not by, more by accident than everything, all the five directors originated in Penang. And we bring to the table an approach to problem solving, which uh, is really reflective of what I call the Penang DNA. We are very frugal, we know how to stretch the dollar, and sometimes we can actually get things for free. You know? And so we spend very little money achieving a lot of objectives. So, like in my position, I'm non-government and I really work with NGOs. I run uh, the Malaysian Heritage Society in KL. And so when I engage with the community and our people engage with the community, they see us as part and parcel of the community. At the same time, uh, we have very strong connections with the co commercial world. So corporate leaders, uh, businessmen of all different races start to trust us when we start to work with them over time. And so we are seen as this platform where all the three sectors come together and we are able to broker a conversation which results in delivery of projects. And that has become our main strength. So when we are asked to intervene in any situation to help solve problems in the urban space, um, we are able to do so because of these relationships. And that's why I call it the sweet spot. We see ourselves as a, an experimental organization. So we start with uh, discovery. We look at how to work with a problem. We look, then we go into the area of ideation. And then once we get that idea together, we start to create prototypes, pilots. And we start to, then we implement it. And if it's a successful model, then we start to replicate. And so what has happened now, what that the experiments we carried out in Georgetown in Penang has now been used in all the other geographies. And it's become a model of engagement. But there's always this very nice feedback system, which then we get feedback from the community. They tell us where we've gone wrong. And when we start to alter this model as well. So the vast range and scale of projects reflect our almost unique identity as what I mentioned, a think and do tank. So we start with very, very small and low hanging fruits until going to a very large and high level of almost, we'll call it territorial and regional planning. And I'll show you some examples of that. But there are two major beliefs that drive our work. One, we believe in evidence-based planning, right? So if we are able to get the data to back up what we are claiming, we will not move forwards. But more importantly is that we stress to all the people that work with us is that we have to put people at the heart of the solution. And we have to gain their trust and we have to make them believe that we put them at the heart of the solution. And so over time, it's a given now. Right? So some of our current projects. So the large scale ones, we have worked on something called the Malacca Straits Diagonal Territorial Plan. We actually look at how to activate uh, the whole Straits of Malacca Diagonal from the north of Malaysia to the south in Singapore. And this we work with many different sort of spatial partners, planning partners, one of which is, for example, the Fundacion Metropoli from Spain, Madrid. And they have helped us engage in lots of these projects. So in fact, all that I show you, every one of them has been a singular report, which then dovetails into a very comprehensive report. And we do this for the government, right? And then we looked at one city and three countries, and at one time they're actually speaking about how do we actually look at it as a region and not as single countries. Right? Then we are also engaged in city-making ideas at a very large level. Through the projects that we've done, 
over time, and when we had moved into Kuala Lumpur, we started to look at the areas in the city that have hollowed out, areas that uh, are not really being used by the local population. And what happened is that when the government created a new capital called Putrajaya in the south, a lot of the people left the city. And so you had this remarkable heritage core, which uh, really hollowed out and only had a lot of migrant workers living in it and very few businesses that were really generating a lot of uh, creative interest. So on our own, we thought about how do we revitalize the city center. And one of the things that we do is that we start to do what we call a baseline survey, evidence base. So we go in, we spend our own money, we do a whole baseline survey of the, the, the heritage area that we're working in, and then based on those facts, we start to shape the plan. So in fact, amazingly, as what we try to call now the KL Creative and Cultural District, we found that the majority of uh, people living in that core area were migrant workers. There were very few local people living in it. And there were businesses, but they were very localized businesses. And so, and we found that there were 200 homeless people. So this was the population we had to work with. But slowly we have managed to turn it around and eventually we have seeded projects in the core area which has now given the government reason to believe that they can actually start to gazette it as a conservation zone. But it starts with taking these small steps and it starts with uh, really knowing your facts about a place. So this... So when we look at the core area, we look at all the different interventions that can happen in the core area. One of the things that we did quickly, and which required no money at all, was that we upgraded what we call a laneway, a back lane, very much like what you have in Macau, very narrow streets and um, buildings coming close to it, and un underutilized, neglected. Mm -hmm. But using, using uh, persuasion and communication and engagement with local people, uh, step by step, building by building, door by door, alleyway by alleyway, we managed to get them to redo the whole walkway, the whole back lane, for free. Everybody chipped in. And we, we did all the painting ourselves, we did all the tiling ourselves, we got volunteers to come in. And so we, we showed that how, if you work with community, at a very low level of uh, financing, but create that belief that they can, they can change the environment, it starts to happen. And one of the most rewarding part about this is that the local authority now has taken over this role. All of a sudden they say, oh, it's a good idea. Let's take over all the back lanes in Kuala Lumpur and we'll do it. And so we are out of the job. But that's the wonderful part about it. You see it, People believe in it and you walk away. Then you engage in new projects. But with very little input, but a lot of late work. You know. Can you imagine just having to talk to the homeless and telling them, uh, please don't defecate in this area. I'm going to do it up. You know, and say, but that's my home. So this is all these very engaging, very interesting conversations you have. But eventually you will come then and you learn about how when you go down to the ground, and you actually find out what the problem is, the solutions are very different. So we started in Georgetown with the grants program right, in two, 2009. Right? And our mission was, as I mentioned, to use small projects to catalyze the regeneration of the inner city. So one of the key things that we, we ask ourselves is, does this project we finance catalyze change? And we have to convince that it does. We convince it does. And so the underlying philosophy was actually we wanted improved livability while driving economic transformation. And so these are the things that is, that, that's always in our minds that we, we want to reach that objective. So we used the World Heritage side of Georgetown as what we call the lab. So we spent about 16.5 million in the year 2009 to 2014. In 2008, Georgetown was listed a World Heritage Site. The town was actually in a state of dilapidation and neglect. 
And this project, the Mission House, was a project <coughs> which I personally worked on. And we put it together and we transform it in something that's a very viable site today. But what Flink City does is we do not give the grantee all the money. We give about 10 to 20 percent. The rest has to come from the grantee. grantee. And there's a, there's a payback clause. If at any time they sell off the site, they pay us back the money. And a couple of them have actually done that. Because they found that with our help, the value of the land has gone up so much that they, can, they cannot refuse an offer that's been given to them. Right? This was another project I helped work on. And this was now called the Seven Terraces. If you Google it, you'll find that it's the top heritage hotel in Penang, but it was really a direct lit site. So all these had grants given to them. We also seeded sort of like the intangible uh, things like dance, music, festivals. And for five to six years, Penang had something called the Georgetown Festival. And every year we chose projects and we seeded it and we, we helped enable the, the, the mindset change that there was. So now it's become a rest festival which everybody starts to say like, okay, middle of the year in August, we are going to Penang. Also, we looked at the, the material culture, the skills, the traits, and whoever brings the, the project to us, we actually will assess it. We get a technical advisor to look at it separate from ourselves. And then the project kicks off. So we have seeded many, many projects like you see there. Uh, which is what we call the living heritage. And I think criteria three on which Macau is, the set, historic centre of Macau is listed, is also about the living heritage. So uh, we've been very successful in trying to get people to recognise and retain the existing traits and the existing uh, intangible values of the site. So this was the footprint of our grants programme. So covers the whole city and you know it resulted in about 300 projects being delivered and then we started to look at much bigger picture what we found that uh, the north sea front and the east sea front very much like your harbor area was not tackled on a comprehensive basis so we worked with the Aga Khan trust for culture uh, from Geneva, and we persuaded them to be partners with us. So we courted them over a period of five years, and eventually they said, yes, we will come and work with you in Penang. And we, together we created what we call a strategic master plan of how to revitalize as big parcels of land in the city. And it's been a very, very successful uh, partnership to date. They worked with us on this. This is a park in the middle of the city. It's actually the, the thieves' market. Right? So, but, so every evening, it builds up until about 4, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Then it becomes this very, very, very uh, seedy sort of environment. But what, what do we do? Do we just conclude that, say, no, we're going to kick them out? We didn't do that. We did our baseline surveys, we collected data on footfall, we talked to the, the residents of the city and what emerged from this exercise was this was a wonderful space in the city but nobody dared to go with it. You know? So mothers with children would never dare venture into an environment like this. And it's, You can buy a stolen radio, you can buy one, one side of a shoe, you can buy almost anything in this tea's market. So it was a very, very uh, aggressive space, you know. So after the, we did this complete survey and we got a consensus of what it should be, we, tr we transformed it to this. And like anywhere else, the, 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 the mafia, the underground people were the ones who controlled the site. So we had the police come in to talk, we had to engage with them ourselves, we had to send in emissaries, the whole lot. It was a year of conversations, right? But with great determination, we delivered a park to them. And now it's a neighbourhood park, um, tourists as well as residents come and use it. And we persuaded the government to give the police market another street to go to, which is opposite police station. 
so they loved it. <laughs> uh, so it's a win-win situation. Then we also looked at, uh, as I mentioned, we looked at the north and east seafront of the World Heritage Site, and we, we looked at the fort, this called Fort Cornwallis. And we, we sort of studied it, and we spoke with, with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and we looked at the strategic plan and said, this was the original site of Penang when it first developed, and it's in the, it's in the mess. Why don't we actually restore it back to its period of highest significance? So we, up to date, we have started working on it, and it's amazing what the process has dug up, you know. Uh, together with, we are working with Italian masons, we are working with Italian craftsmen, we are working with Indian craftsmen, all of these people have come together, we are working with archaeologists. So it's a, it's a very multidisciplinary, very multifaceted project, which really has brought conservation to its highest level, right? So much so that I don't think I could ever learn how to do a, a second grade conservation project again. It's, it's, it's been such a wonderful learning curve. So we started with a conservation management plan. And then as a, as a result of the conservation management plan, we started to do all the conservation work. And one of the objectives we had was to actually restore the moat. So what you see is a wonderful drone photograph of the outline of the fort and the excavation shows about five or six layers of different foundations that exist. And slowly we are trying to bring it back to what it was. But we don't do it, uh, as we said, it's evidence-based. We just don't do it and say, we're going to create a moat. We actually went to the site, we looked at all the issues, we had to work out which layer to take away. We even went through three different pilot uh, uh, projects of how to bring back the moat. So that eventually when we do the, choose the final product, um, everybody knows that it works. And it may seem like a very simple exercise, but until you go through the hard road on getting to an answer, we actually don't start implementation. But that's one of the very challenging things that we face with. And as soon as we found two cannons, lo and behold, the chief minister says, I want to be there. And so he gets all the kudos for starting the project. But there are many discoveries like that. And then they said, okay, why don't you look at how do you activate the, the, the waterfront which faces east? So we, we looked at the plan and we did a, did a sort of simulation of what it could be. And then we are inviting architects to come and do proposals for us. And we actually work out uh, what is the cost benefit of doing such a project. And this is what we presented to the government. We talked about, you know, USD capital investment of 132 million. It will unlock 388 mil of potential revenue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is backed by, you know, um, actual calculations and actual examination of the structure on the site, etc. And as I said, you know, it's we have to make it believable to the government when we present it. So because of that, we also have started have to start looking at the bigger picture. So we start to look at the link between the island and the mainland, which is about one kilometer wide. <laughs> this is Hong Kong Harbor, right? So we looked at ourselves and we saw that the distance between Georgetown, which is on the island, and Butterworth, which is a port destination on the other side, is about 1.5 kilometers. So we started to look at it as a greater agglomeration of a single city, not as separate cities. And so the planners have not looked at that in the plans, so we took it upon ourselves, engaging with different government agencies to come up with an idea. So we look at the site, which is now a very a brownfield site with industry and everything, and we looked at how it could be intensified. I hate this plan, but it just... Something you put to the government and say, yes, okay, I can, I can build a lot here. But, but it started with just redoing the, the, the ferry hub, right? But the, the, the thing that I love most now is that we have started on a project called Green Connectors, Green Connector Corridors for Penang. So what we looked at is in the center of the island, we have a beautiful for hill range of uh, prime forest, primary forest. And we 
we sort of looked at the proposition of how do we bring the sea and connect it to the hills. And so we have looked at corridors of connection. And after doing this study, we went to the local government, we went to the state government and said, yes, we will adopt it. And interestingly enough, um, it's all based on actual ecological studies. And what came out of this, which is the new thing, is that we are now looking at this project as part of climate adaptation, which is about climate change and how do you mitigate against rise, rises in temperature in the city. Uh, and so this project has become something that the state has adopted in order to answer the challenge of what are you doing for climate change. Right? And that's as a matter of interest, there's three billion available for anybody who has a climate change adaptation project that you can bring to UN Habitat or you can bring to other agencies who are supposed to seed these projects. Right? They call it adaptation because you cannot change what's happening in the world. It's going to happen. The temperature is going to rise. But how do you stop it in your own backyard? Right? And there's money for it. So Clean City has already pivoted and said, OK, uh, we, we're not going to do back lanes anymore since the government has taken that over. We'll do things that they're not aware of or not interested in. Right? And also concomitant with all that we're doing, we are also uh, at the back, in the back rooms, shaping policy and decision making. Right? So in the 10th Malaysia plan, we spoke about you know, about greening the city, making it more friendly, working with the heritage. And we looked at, in the main report, we talked about achieving a system of competitive cities in Malaysia, and that, then they started adopting it. Because we've always said that the paradigm today is that the competition globally is between cities and not between countries. And so if we don't make our cities uh, great and vibrant places and viable places, we lose the country, so to speak. So you think of some place like Macau, how do you make it competitive? You know? I mean, besides the very mono, mono businesses that you have in terms of casino, how do you look at it beyond that in a much more long-term fashion? And we also worked on the premise that creative people will look for creative cities to work in. And people nowadays look for a place to work in rather than a job. And in a global survey, they found that 60 or 70 percent of pe people today, especially the young, will choose the, the, the city first before they choose the job. So we are looking at that trend and trying to see how to accommodate it. Then we also commented on the 11th Malaysia plan, which brought forward our game changer, which is investing in competitive cities. So we have gone in. And so you look at uh, the big picture and then look at the projects that we have been engaged in. And we actually sometimes bring these projects to the decision makers. Um, it fits into the actual plan that the nation has. But we have already preempted that plan, if you know what I mean. And so we have now started to influence what we call the 12th Malaysia Plan. You know? So we could talk about one primary super city, we talk about the mega uh, con conurbation nation, which I spoke about earlier, and then we talk about the network nation. And so they've actually put it into that uh, 12th Malaysia Plan, and they're actually going to announce it and get on with it. But it all starts with you know, plans that were seeded a long time ago. So it's something that we started to think about and we've in fact created now a proper department in our company called Urban Solutions. Because everything that I've spoken about starts with an idea of well, how do you solve an urban problem? How do you engage in order to deliver change for the better? And how do we include people in that formula? And so we found that now we might as well look at something called Urban Solutions and it's the fastest growing uh, program in our company today. Because every other project we touch is about providing an urban solution. 
But we never thought about it when we started. I spoke about this earlier. So the Kuala Lumpur Creative and Cultural District is a, is a strategic master plan which will be now adopted by the city. And when, when a new chief minister was appointed in Penang two years back, he must have said, I'm going to create my own policies, right? So he turned to us and he turned to another organization called Penang Institute. And we worked together. And he just told us, I want a family-focused, green and safe city. Smart city and that's all. But he had no idea of how to do it. So we came up with this plan, which identified areas and we identified action. Sorry, it's a bit small, but it's just to show that uh, it's a 2030 plan. We drafted it for the chief minister. He announced it. I don't think he really understood what we put into the paper, but we wrote a speech for him. And now we have gone into a conversation with UN Habitat, who have, who have agreed that they will use Penang as a lab. Earlier, we got the chief minister and the state government to sign an MOU with UN Habitat to use it as, recognize it as the first state to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals as an objective. And that's, there are 17 goals that UN has produced, and we said we'll be the first city to do it, first state to do it. Um, why I'm telling you this is, you know, when you, when you think ahead, and you try and imagine what I call possible futures, you look at different scenarios, you can almost imagine what would happen if you take a particular direction. And so we already, through our investigations, have come up with data which uh, we have learned how to use. So like if we go into the city, we already have the whole uh, image of what the city looks like. And in Penang, I just take a step back, we actually did the whole GIS system for the city, for the Georgetown. We literally spent two years putting in a GIS system which we sort of mapped every single asset in the city. And so, having done that, that's in our database. And every time we do a project, we just go back to that database. And every three years, we upgrade that database. You know? So, we always have a strategic advantage over other people who try and operate in that same landscape. And so, basically, I'm saying is that this vision that we created for the government this year is not accidental. It was deliberately step by step, thinking it through, but finding a way to persuade the government to, to accept that this is the way forwards. And as they say, once it becomes their idea, you've sold the, you've sold the, you've sold the project totally. And that only comes with a particular approach to problem solving and wanting to really look at true urban regeneration. So, key statistics. We have now seeded or completed almost 726 projects. We have uh, the co-investment ratio about three, 3 to 1, 1 to 3. So, we've managed to get uh, 300 million co-investment to date. Um, the total funding we've used is 90 million over, over 10 years. So the total economic value is 600 million. So this is direct uh, response to all the projects that we have seeded. And when we speak to government at certain levels, and one of our supporters is actually the Minister of Finance, he only wants to look at this. He doesn't care what your project looks like, give me the figure so that he can go to the country and say, look, I'm backing this particular company and they're doing this project and I want them to do deliver the project for us. So it's a, it's a wonderful space to be in, but I think the responsibility is very, very great. You know, sometimes I have sleepless nights not thinking that we have taken on too much. Lastly, I just want to talk about uh, this indoor stadium called Stadium Nagara. Um, why I put it in is because I think it would be interesting to Dokomomo. This is an indoor stadium 
built in 1969, two years after independence. And it's been gazetted as a national heritage site. But every national heritage site, it's compulsory that a conservation management plan is, is drafted by the Department of Heritage. But they have no expertise. So they came to Think City. We signed a memorandum of understanding and said, OK, we will undertake all the conservation management plans for all your national heritage sites, one by one. And we'll find you with the money to do it. So we became their delivery partner. But here I'm just sharing with you, after I created this, had to create this conservation management plan, I also thought that it should be a new opportunity to look at modern heritage in Malaysia, right? which is something uh, nobody has started talking about yet. And I'm sure Toko Momo is in that position you know, all over the world. They want to look at modern heritage. They want to look at things that were built you know, after the Second World War, that sort of thing. And a lot of this is being destroyed and demolished. And so we, I use that as an opportunity to put in a new framework for assessing modern sites. Okay? So I thought I'd just end by sharing this with you. So in the assessment of uh, the site, sorry, I first started out with the premise of what's the difference between modern buildings and traditional heritage buildings, right? So I think you all know all this, but I'm just setting the tone of it. So we, we use this to explain it to the, the heritage department because they are very used to the traditional way of looking at conservation. Okay, so we know that uh, in modern buildings, they minimize the use of historic fabric and decoration. So it was simpler. Uh, they, they, they turn to industrialization and new systems of construction. And most of the buildings now consist of components and manufactured parts to achieve certain functions as a process of design. So it became inseparable from the design. And in normal conservation, we look at failure of parts, right? Whereas in modern buildings, it's a failure of systems. And this is a paradigm that we have to now shift and tell conservationists that you cannot look at it in the same old manner anymore. I mean, if an air conditioning system that was installed 30 years ago breaks down, you have to put in a new one, and the system will be completely different. If you put in, use concrete poorly in those days, and now the concrete has failed, what do you do? If your curtain walling, which was trendy in those days, but very new, now have failed, and basically like Hancock building in the States, it starts falling off the structure, are you going to tell me you must keep the same system? So when a system fails, be prepared that the, the issue of authenticity is tackled in a different manner, right? So in addition, we also looked at other protocols, the Hoyan protocols, of which I also had an opportunity to be part of the drafting team. One of the things that we mentioned then, looking at the Asian context, is that we also have to uh, consider what we call the chemical, physical, and mechanical compatibility of interventions in traditional spaces. Right? So that was actually anticipating modernity itself. So, this was a premise which I started out by explaining to the heritage bodies. And then I thought, um, we are actually in a very, very difficult situation when we look at traditional charters, right? So if you look at uh, the Bara Charter, for example, they have a value system, but they have five values. And they'll say it's aesthetic, scientific, social, and two others. But they don't say it's architectural, they don't say it's landscape. Then when I teach at Hong Kong U and I look at somebody else talk about values, they have a totally different set of values. So I, I had this conversation with the former cultural advisor for UNESCO in Bangkok, Richard Inglehart, and we've been friends for many years. We said, surely we, there should be another way to view it. And that's why I bring it to the table for you to think about. We said, why don't we use the World Heritage Convention criteria as a value system? So if you know that in Macau, for example, 
they talk about the criteria as, and they state that there is outstanding universal value in the historic centre. And that's the key word, outstanding universal value. So we argued that if we want to think of one heritage conservation handbook that is used by every country in the world, it's what we call the operational guidelines. Right? It's in English, French, Spanish, two other languages. So any, any person that you speak to who understands world heritage can communicate in the same language. So what Richard came up with was that he assigned keywords to all the criteria. Right? That means the first criteria, what would be a keyword for it? And this is what we did. So for the 10 criteria that uh, exist in the operational guidelines for outstanding universal value, we gave them a description. So if we look at, I'll show you two, three, four, and six, because that's what Macau is using as the criteria for the World Heritage Site. So the reason why we started to look at keywords and um, single words to express what those criteria mean is because when you talk about something, say, innovation, and you speak to any student, and you speak to any professional, they can give you a whole thesis on the idea of innovation. But if you frame it in sort of heritage language, you lose them. I'll show you something. Right. Okay. So criteria two is what you have used for Macau, to exhibit an interchange of human values over a span of time within cultural area of the world, on development in architecture or technology, monumental arts, town planning and landscape design. Now try, try to understand what I mean by this long sentence. I think you know, it'll take you a long time just to absorb this. So if I said it's about communication, right? It, it starts to fall into place, right? Then there's the third criteria, okay, which is uh, to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is living or which has disappeared. So simply, it's about diversity, right? And then the fourth one, to, to be an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural or technological ensemble or landscape which illustrates significant stages in human history, right? So you, so you try and figure out about Macau, you know, who came first, etc., etc. But it's about development, right? Human development and the, and the passage of time. And then number six, to be directly or intangibly associated with events or living traditions, with ideas or with beliefs, with artistic and literary works of outstanding universal significance. So simply it means it's about the idea. Okay? So we started applying this way of assessing Stadium Merdeka. Right? So you put all of these uh, criteria, criteria together, in the sense of how you want to form, transmit, and preserve knowledge. So you have that in mind. And so we put it all together and we see it as a complete, complete uh, matrix that we can use for assessing a site. So arising out of this, we started to think about a site as having what we call knowledge components as opposed to traditional fabric components. And so we analysed the building and we looked at things like the roof, the air cooling system, the hydraulic stage, the lighting, you know, service tunnels, etc., etc. And all these were in the stadium. But you would never assess it in this fashion if you did a conservation study. You know, I think we would come up with very different uh, classifications. But here we looked at knowledge. And then, as in any heritage site, we, we look at the significance and we look at authenticity. So if we go back to um, the NARA document on authenticity, they'll give you four facets of it, which basically, you know, they'll mention form and design, they'll mention materials and substance, they'll mention function and use. But I think uh, this, these gentlemen, Silver and Sand 
then Jetty, they were working with UNESCO and they were also members of uh, Docomomo in Italy. So they came in with other things. They added tradition, technique, localization and implementation, language, interconnection and interpenetration and integration of the arts. So we expanded the Nara Charter and we added these elements in and we used this to look at significance of the site. And then once we created what we call a statement of cultural significance, and then and we found 12 in relation to this site, we aligned it with conservation goals with the World Heritage Criteria. Okay. And so, for example, okay, if we look at celebrating landmark status, the four criteria that came out our minds was idea, innovation, development, and conservation. Because these are things that have come to bear on the project. And so then we looked at the, the thing about ideas. And we get that again from the criteria. We looked at il events, ideas, and beliefs. And so the, the main objective in answering this criteria that was we had to promote the events that the stadium was that designed for. Reinforce the intention to serve diverse groups, right? So, and then we, when we look at innovation, we looked at a masterpiece of creative genius. So when you look at a modern building and what it, or what it amplified in terms of creative genius, you cannot stop there and say, okay, the period of creative genius is over. No, the life has to go on. So you have to reimagine the building, all right? So we were prepared to look at introducing cutting-edge but sympathetic systems and internal processes that promote innovation. So for example, we found that in modern indoor, indoor stadiums, uh, when you say bring in a concert, right, they need three days. One day to bring, mobilize, they bring in containers on a truck, they take everything out, they mount it, they have the concert and the next day they pack it up and they're out. In this stadium, to do an event, it takes them one and a half weeks. So, in order to answer this issue of innovation and looking at the innovative ways that people have worked in the modern era, we convinced the, the Heritage Department that we had to make very clear interventions in that space, like open up a new section of it so that a truck can go in. You know, things like that. But if, we are, if I had followed the old way, innovation doesn't come into play. All right? so, it, so it also went into development and conservation. So this is just looking at one of the goals that we had established that arose from the significance and we tested the idea and we found that we were able to express ourselves very, very clearly about how to engage with modernity. And so... After done it, we did it for all the goals and we linked them together so that we have a matrix. And so we ended up with the matrix. Okay, it's I'll enlarge it. So we looked at significance in, informed by values, right? So we took the first aspect of innovation. We identified all the different things that were significant, right? And then we looked at what we call attributes. And remember I said instead of four attributes, we had now ten. So we, we looked at it in all 10 of the attributes and we looked at uh, the condition of that and we looked at whether it's viable or not, right? And then just to make life a bit more difficult for people, we inserted goals and guidelines which is actually one step further, right? <coughs> Against the conservation goals which I identified for you earlier, we actually created guidelines and we had indicators which I used from the UNESCO Asia Pacific Heritage Awards, right? So I used the the criteria and turn them into indicators. And we actually identified against each element uh, which indicators they have to use. So it became a very comprehensive matrix of significance and we have about 10 pages of it. So can you imagine if I give it to another third party to now execute the conservation and renovation of the stadium? It's very, very detailed. Right? It touches every aspect of the building and it touches every value that has been identified in 
the operational guidelines. So, so this is a shift that has started to happen for new buildings, right? And we are testing out on other buildings as well. But I think I'll end here. It's just that we, I found that there's a new way to engage in looking at modern buildings, but you have to find a different method of assessment, which is not the traditional method that's being used by many conservation practitioners worldwide. Okay. And so, just to end, we try and think big, but we act small. Right? And we try and keep ourselves nimble. Thank you. Thank you, first of all. Thank you. Uh, I think we can open the session for Q&A. Anyone wants to start? Hello. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, it's very informative, and I think it um, gives a lot of light on what's trying to be done here by many non-government and government bodies. Uh, my question would be, how uh, did you start? How do you start doing something like this, acting small and becoming something so big that you were actually thinking about the, the whole national scene currently? Well, it started with the grants program. So these were very small uh, interventions, right? Restoring a shop house, restoring an area, restoring a park, uh, helping people write a book, you know, helping people map intangible aspects of the culture, but very small interventions. But over time, as I said, over a period of four to five years, we managed to seed over 300 projects, right? So that, and at the same time, we already had built up a network of friendly international groups who, were, who we brought in to support our efforts. So if we had a program, for placemaking, which we didn't know how to do, we brought in PPS from New York and they helped us. If we didn't know how to run a, a sort of high-level conservation course, we brought in Getty Conservation Institute from LA. So we broke at all these partnerships, right? And when we needed to really do very historical sites, we brought in the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. So th these were things that we started to do very early on in, in the life of the company. We, we knew that we couldn't do things alone. But we knew that in partnership with the government, with civil society, with business, and with international groups, we can create a, a critical mass that will have a changing effect on the environment. So that's how we started. So we, we put all those different pieces into play. Not knowing where we're going, but we just had those things put into place. So over time, uh, after we built belief in the fact that our method works, and we proved in many cases where the government couldn't broker an intervention or a project with the, with the public, we were actually able to break through. So it just accelerated and accelerated and accelerated. And one of the nice stories I tell is that as we started the projects in Georgetown, the chief planner came, was given the task of setting up the World Heritage Office, basically like what you have here in terms of in relation to cultural institute, etc. That's, that's the division which looks at the issue of the World Heritage Site. She turned to us and said, I think you better help me. So, okay, so we, we use exactly the same method of engagement and we went out <coughs> and then because she performed she performed so well not us right she was promoted to be mayor of the the what you call it the the council in the mainland across the across the canal across the channel then she said you're following me right because nobody wants to go to Butterworth it's a, it's, a, it's a lost leader, you know. Anybody is no good sent overseas. So we followed her. And every project that we did, she had, she had a brand, she put her touch onto it. 
Okay, so we enabled her as much as she enabled us. And we started little things that, for example, Butterworth Fringe Festival, which had to engage with the people and to show that there is culture on the other side of the, the state, you know. And then she started to learn the language that we started to use, like you have to be inclusive, you have to be community-led, you have to engage with uh, people from all walks of life, you know, that sort of talk. And then she pre presented this paper which, she helped her, which we helped her draft when she went to this World Cities Forum, at, which is a meeting of all the mayors globally, and she gave this passionate speech. Years later, two years later, when they wanted to look for a new general manager for UN Habitat, they headhunted her. She had just been appointed as the mayor of Georgetown and Penang Island. And we were saying, great, now we have an ally going with us all the way. She was headhunted and she was uh, chosen and she's moved to Nairobi. So what I'm saying is that we work in parallel with many agencies and with many uh, like-minded parties. And they help us, we help them. And as they grow, we grow. So every single person, every single department, anybody who allows us to work together with them have grown. And so it, it, rather than being a singular action in space, what we have done has now become what, what was called a movement. So once you, have, you started a movement, you no longer need to intervene because it has a life of its own. And that's a, that's a sh shaggy story about the very one. So you're, <laughs> I've just, just taken the scenic route, I'm afraid. Does that answer your question? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, good evening, Professor. Thank you for coming to Macau. Uh, just a question. C can I assume that part of your urban generative uh, practice or uh, strategy, you incorporate a lot of green trees, plants? Yes. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know Macau. Um, why do you think Macau, mostly the government, is trying to get away from that? Because when they build something, all their roads are well, concrete and, and pavement, and there's no trees anymore. What do you think the reason is about it? What reason is? Uh, maybe they don't value trees. You know, as simple as that. Or they need maintenance. But I mean, there's a municipal mindset, right? Trees, the branches break. When the storm comes, when the typhoon is here, everything is disrupted. We have to come, come along and chop it up and remove it, you know? <coughs> so very often we find that, that the officers who run the city, not the mayor or everything, uh, they look at the easy way out. And so trees are a source of inconvenience. And when anything happens, you get a phone call in the middle of the night. A tree is blocking my, has fallen in my garden, you bloody well come here and clear it. So it's, it's that sort of mindset. I'm not sure that it's the same in Macau, but I think it's an administrative <coughs> thing which you try and avoid. Uh, and there's a lot of liability in it, right? One tree fell down and killed somebody and, you know, the, the whole city was sued. But I think on a, on a larger level, a more broader level, it's maybe they don't understand the true value of why keep trees, right? You tell them it's just for decoration. Okay, we'll find another way to do it. But now that if, we, if I bring in the example of the green... The, the green connectors, it has to do with much larger issues at hand. And rather than figure out why they don't like trees in Macau, it's now give them a reason to like trees. So the thing that we introduced quite recently to the government is that we talked about uh, tree corridors, wind corridors, and we demonstrated how in different cities worldwide, where when you have a whole alley of trees at a particular height, it starts to bring in the winds into the inner city strategically, and then the city starts to cool down. So we take more a positive stance rather than a negative stance, and we always say, how do we turn 
you know, uh, a disaster in opportunity. So we look for a solution. And th that works most of the time. Uh, thank you, professors, for your lectures. Wonderful. And uh, I think I would like to ask a question, which is more maybe a bit embarrassed in some way because of uh, have you done any, have you admissions a project, however, that have not been supported by governments or have not been able to carry throughout? Can you explain those failure? Because I think we learn a lot more from failure than success. All those projects you've good, done is great. Uh, also, the other second question is, uh, the first project is shown about the link, right? The, uh, the transformation of the link, back link. Interestingly, when you're doing those, um, people may ask, it's good to do one link uh, success, and then why pick that one and not pick the other one? We will, I want to do, a, I want to see that, is there any other post evaluation you have done after 10 years of transformations? What have done to the city? And have everyone, have, every, have the city carry through your visions on making it, uh, economic, economical engines or, or whatever uh, uh, change that change that part of the city. I want you to uh, just touch up the these two questions. One is about uh, failures and okay. about the, the post Thank acceptance. you. Acceptance. Like any other, like any other, any company, that you will say that there are failures, right? Failures in persuading them to do the right thing. Okay, and not often you can succeed in that. And if you fail with the left hand, you look for the right hand, right? I'm an optimist. I always believe that somebody in this room somewhere can turn the key. It's just, who do you turn to? Failures in the sense that they think that once they adopt your approach, they'll have to do a lot more work. Case in point, we had one street which we wanted to green because in the early days we talked about greening the city and shared spaces. And so shared spaces were open spaces, streets, etc. And we wanted to green them. So there's one street which we persuaded them to plant trees. And we brought in the best landscape architect in the country to design it for us. We had all sorts of excuses. Uh, there are too many cables beneath the table. Uh, and we don't have anybody in our landscape department to plant the trees. The list was very long, right? But eventually we persisted and persisted and persisted because we felt that we can create a pilot, but you must take ownership of it. And that's, a, that's a, the principle. So eventually we got the street done after two years of just planting 20 trees, right? After that, they said, hey, that's easy. So they started doing it. And the resistance is always there. But they will always find very valid excuses. So they said, so we said, okay, we're going to survey and do a test to see whether they're cables or not. So we found no cables. And nobody, you know? So the failure is sometimes um, a resistance to change more than anything else. So you have to lead by example. And then very often they... And then you have to also put it in their heads that they were the originators of the idea. That's, that's always the approach. We don't take credit for anything. So that's about failures, right? And there are many moments where you, you want to give up. What's your next question about? <laughs> yeah. Um, all the time, you know. I mean, that, that's the whole basis of a pilot. Did it work? Did it not work? Uh, what did we do wrong? Right? Then we have post-mortem. And they found that there were many things that they didn't do right. So they said, Lawrence, can you not just be a director, can you be the, the technical advisor with oversight? So all of a sudden, I was very happy sitting in a chair, coming... Uh, once every two months for a meeting, all of a sudden I had to travel all around the country. But because I had the expertise to look at things in a macro level, and I've worked long enough to know what works on site and what doesn't. Right? So I was brought in because there were many, many 
uh, difficulties that they encountered in terms of the reassessment. And so it also uh, falls into the sphere <coughs> of capacity building. You have to allow the people you employ to make the mistakes. But somebody must come in and clean it up. Right? And learn how to be politically correct and say, no, oh, it's not really a mistake, but I was just trying out something. You know, There are many ways to skin a cat and squirm out of a problem. But I always believe that you have to allow the mistakes, or else they'll never learn. Right? And so far it's worked. They grow up very fast. Um, may, I, may I pick this subject of the <laughs> reassessment mm -hmm. uh, and shifting a little bit to Macau, mm -hmm. trying to pick your knowledge and, okay. <laughs> and understanding of Macau, uh, and considering this um, idea of the reassessment of the world uh, heritage in the Macau, mm -hmm. um, trying to know what are the challenges and the opportunities that we are facing in this moment with this uh, reassessment, and if in which way can we go further and behind the the, the world heritage uh, classified buildings, and even further from the buffer zone, so on and so forth. So my question is. How can we use this uh, opportunity to try to explore uh, options and opportunities to consider extending this uh, mm -hmm. this uh, experience of uh, okay. having uh, the downtown classified by well, one one you're being very ambitious, <laughs> so it's, it's a good thing. Um, I have to take you back a bit, you know. But when, when I first landed in Macau, it was Portuguese territory. <laughs> Then I landed in Macau again, and it became Chinese territory. So I've seen the growth of it. Uh, I was here in the 80s and then the 90s, and then after the World Heritage Listing. So I've seen how Ma Macau has evolved. When you look at World Heritage Listing, it is actually it's only a trigger. You cannot look at it as a be-all and end-all. It's only getting the recognition in order to unlock potential. And you have to look at it as that. When they ask you to prepare a heritage management plan or a conservation management plan, they not just want to see how you manage a site. They want to see how you manage change. And so you have to anticipate where the change is going to come from. And then you have to look beyond the mere label of World Heritage Listing, and that's where most heritage sites start to stop and slow down. And so having had the privilege of traveling in and out of Macau for three decades, actually when I came in and I looked at the site I evaluated, uh, and this is off the record, it was a very simplistic approach to identifying a site. Now when I look at what they call the historic centre, it was just a play of words and a play of buildings to, to demonstrate that there was a route. So there was very... Whoever crafted the dossier was a very smart man, or the team was very smart. They chose the right touch, the right language. But when I look at it today, in the context of all the, the World Heritage sites I've visited and those that I really admire, it's a very childish concept in Macau today. It's not a criticism. You had to start it somewhere. And so you should ask yourself now, if I'm going back to the issue of preserving my heritage, the heritage of the people of Macau, not the heritage of people of China and the whole world, but just up yourselves, what do I have to do now? I have to look, look beyond this simplistic idea. I have to look at beyond this simplistic matrix and turn it into a very complex matrix, right? Which I've tried to do for a simple building. But when you put those pieces together and you start to relate 50, 100 things in, inside this matrix, you start to see a value which you never saw before. 
But you have to ask those questions. And you have to tell yourself, the World Heritage Site, which is a little sliver on the hill, was only the beginning. <coughs> what about the rest of the island? The whole island is a heritage site. You cannot separate it out. <coughs> and so my question to Hui this, this afternoon or other people was that, you're, you're, you're sitting within you know, the, Chinese, the Chinese quarter, the inner harbour area, which is really Chinatown. But has there ever been a conversation about the Chinese legacy? Right? And I don't believe so, because it was never in the dossier. So, but when you start to think much more deeply about the issue of heritage conservation and why you're conserving the Macau story, you start to pose these questions. Automatically, your boundaries widen. Once they widen, it becomes a vision for where you want to go. And it has come from the people in Macau. Right? And in fact, UNESCO encourages people to extend their boundaries. But, but very few people bother because they've already got the badge of honour, they say. You've got a kudos, that's it. You know, we've got other better things to do. But if it goes back to the fundamental reason for why you wanted a listing, right, then you have to move on but you move on the smart way. So I can imagine now if you say, okay, let's look at the territory on both sides of the historic centre. That is also historic Macau. Right? And if I look at the layers of history, even the, the 60s, the 70s is also the last century. You know, we are in the 21st century. Everything is from the last century. Isn't that heritage already? Give it another 20, 30 years, you have 100, your 1960s buildings are already 100 years old, very quickly. So you have to look ahead and you have to question yourself. By, by looking at it in that fashion, and I've just started to think about it myself, because I feel very guilty for recommending Macau as the World Heritage Site. Then I look at it. How could it fall for such a simple solution? Honestly, I feel quite guilty. Having, having moved ahead you know, in the last 18 years, I should have said, no, I think we should extend the site. And maybe at that time, the government might have agreed because I made them change the buffer zone boundary. And they just did it. Then, then, the next day, they went at the meeting and they changed the boundary. So now I think about it, why didn't I push the core area much bigger <laughs> and move it to the sea. I, mean, I, was, I was dumb, you know, I was really dumb. And if I had the chance again, I would have done it differently. Uh, but that's, that's the benefit of having worked on many sites. I'm just sharing with you that there is a way forwards, <coughs> but you have to craft it in a very, very clever way. You know, it cannot be threatening. It cannot be like, oh, we want to move the boundary. No. You see it, but this is part of our story. And that's how Penang started. We had something called the Penang story, and we had a colloquium of about 10 different meetings with different people, and we just sat people down and we mapped these stories. Right? And we looked at street names, and, and one was called, uh, in Chinese, Sinke, New Street, and we figured out, why did you call it New Streets? So we went back to the old people and said, that's the street where the new women came. So the, the, the fresh products came to the new street. Then after that, they, they went to the older streets. And so that's how the name came about. But so did, everybody came and told these stories which you never knew. And now this has escalated into uh, huge publications in Penang. We have published more books in the last 10 years than Penang has published in the last 200 years. And that's all from trying to map the story. Right? So when people start to do their own storytelling and they start to look at what they want to, to put into writing, we just say, okay, how much is it going to cost? Uh, you give us the rights to distribute it, that's all. And so we're getting really wonderful traction in terms of the, the mapping the culture and the stories of the place. And once, once you have that plethora of information in front of you, 
you are able to answer the government when it starts to do actions that go against what the story is all about. I remember that, sorry, I, I, I tend to you know, get into all these examples. There was a beautiful jetty, which very much like what you have, a uh, vernacular jetty in Penang in the harbour area. And it was the only Muslim jetty. The people actually came from the north, right? Migrated through China. They were Persians. And then they landed in Penang. So we, we, we call, so these are what we call clan jetties. And these people are called the Khois in Hokkien. But uh, they were really sort of people of Persian origin. And so we fought back tooth and nail to save that community. They had Islamic traditions. They had, they, during Ramadan, they didn't eat pork. They had special utensils, everything. But they were not Muslims. But when you follow them back to China, they had all calligraphy in Arabic, you know, written on the tombs. And so we brought all that together and we brought the, the, the museums board and we got the heritage people and we lobbied the government. No way. They demolished it and put a high rise in its place. And so I remember forever and ever I walked into this room and we had a state heritage committee. Then I said, Chief Minister, you are destroying one of the most unique communities that Penang has ever had. His answer was, you should have told me. I mean, I literally my jaw dropped and said, what? You're kidding, right? I should have told you. You are the government. You should know better. But I didn't know better, right? I didn't have that information until we investigated it. So what I'm saying about this storytelling and this mapping of oral history and everything is that as you accumulate the information and the data and you put it into the data bank, Anytime there's a problem, an issue, something that goes against the grain, you have proof that it's already there. You know, we were too late, uh, but I never forget this one. I, up till today, it's been 20 years later, and I still, it's still there in my head. I say, how can the government person, the, the chief executive of state, say that I had to tell him? Right? So now you can, because you will have all that information. And quite interestingly, just to share with you, we are now thought, what is the next area of engagement that Think City has to move into? Since we have already been doing a lot of baseline studies and we are good at data collection, we thought we'll go into big data. But as more as a, a social uh, interest group to support government, and we think that we can collect data without people being suspicious of us because we have never used it except for common good. So it goes with the track record. So it allows us to move ahead right, into new areas of expertise which normally you would not think of as an individual. But we are already thinking about it. right? But to support government issues. So I imagine that 10 years down the road or 5 years down the road, and there's anything that the government has to plan or civil society wants to engage in, we already can support them with very, very, very big data in order to make decisions about the space. Right? But it always relates back to heritage. And that is our mandate. And it always relates back to that. Whatever we do, it must not be for profit. And then, so people trust us. Right? Okay, I don't know how I got there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor. Very interesting uh, lecture. I have one question that I, I didn't hear you talk about, as you know Macau very well, uh, as I understood. Uh, during your, uh, your practice uh, at the urban, uh, urban scale, more than the small scale, have you ever uh, had to deal with uh, the contradiction between development, new constructions, and heritage areas, um, as we have in Macau? 
it's <coughs> it's endemic, right? It happens in all heritage areas all around the world. So it's something which we deal with. But vis-a-vis -a, -vis a World Heritage Site, you know, and one of the conditions that UNESCO has imposed upon Macau is that you have to create a conservation management plan. And since 2004, you have not done it, but I know that it's about to be approved. But what we found that is, is that when you have a plan or a document which has the force of law behind it, then you can stop these intrusions. But as long as it's just policy guideline with no force of law behind it, uh, in, interested parties can get things to be changed or waived. You know what I mean? Which is very much the political situation throughout the whole of Asia, not just unique to Macau. It happens even in Penang, right? Right, right in front of our eyes. So it's trying to see how do you manage issues like that, right? But to answer your question, yes, it happens time and time and time again. And it's like fighting fires. And you say, you know, you're tired of fighting fires, but, you know, we become very good firefighters. Huh? Very, very good. Uh, what happens in Penang is that we hold demonstrations. If you, I don't advise you to hold them. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. <laughs> right. No, I mean, right. But very good at that. And... It's amazing that we have managed to go to a very closed door physical planning meeting by the chaired by the Prime Minister against something that's being implemented in Penang, exactly as you're saying. They're looking at major infrastructure systems which will really break up the whole environment. And you know that with infrastructure systems like an MRT, where the stations are, they're going to have huge development. You know? So it's a property play. So we're literally fighting that battle now as I speak to you. But we have managed, because of uh, the way we have demonstrated that we are working for the public good. And I'm not talking about Think City. Think City keeps out of this. <coughs> I work for another group called Penang Forum. And so what happens is that all of a sudden, we use our influence to get into what we call the physical planning meeting where all the state governments are there, together with the federal government, and we did our presentation. And the chief minister was there who was promoting this huge transportation master plan and he said, how did they get in? So, I mean, it was, it was amazing. He just loved the look on his face. And he really literally had to write a blog about his experience. But... It's, it's finding ways to engage. And you set your mind to it and you're very determined. You are able to get a hearing, you know? So, short, short answer is yes. All the time. You, you, you never, you'll never have a single day where you do not meet, have to meet a challenge like that. You just keep on fighting. Right? Yeah. Thank you for your explanation. Very, very interesting. Uh, I think, anyway, we are talking about very different realities, Malaysia and Macau. No comparison at all. Uh, there's something that uh, I would like to ask you. Uh, I couldn't understand at the very beginning of your explanation uh, the relationship between this foundation that you are working under which somehow supports all your activities and the potential contradiction between those who support or the foundation that supports your work and the difficulties that arise in terms of relationship from the fact that it, this, this organization belongs or is related to, to, to somehow to the government, let's mm -hmm. say, and the activities that uh, you carry on that sometimes go against the best interest 
uh, in between uh, comments <coughs> that uh, might be represented by the daily uh, activities of the government itself. So is on one side, the government is supporting a, a, a body mm -hmm. that is acting against the interests of the government. How, how are you able to <coughs> overcome this uh, on an institutional level, not based on being persistent and clever and using the right words and so on and so forth, but how do you overcome, because not that long ago in Malaysia we have, a, we had, you had, not us, a, a very unique situation of endemic corruption and so on and so forth, and at the same time, they were, I'm sorry, using the expression, but no, it seems you. to be the case, right? Since, the, since that happened, we have learned interesting things about how, collected, how they collected some dollars <laughs> from somebody else. Um, so the question is, how did you manage to overcome all, I, I believe, these uh, uh, difficulties Related to this to this situation, or arising from this, mm -hmm. this situation. And and the second question is really, before you started these actions, you got the subsidies, or you started and then you apply for the financial support. That's another thing that is important. Thank you. Yes, as as I mentioned, Think City was set up to administer a grants program with money provided by the Ministry of Finance. But they channeled it through the sovereign fund, Kazana. Okay? And then they, they cracked their head and said, how do we administer grants? So that's where we came in. They said, okay, we'll, we'll set up a special purpose vehicle to just do this job. So we were actually using government money to seed projects in the World Heritage Site. And we, everybody knew that we were actually a subsidiary of the sovereign fund, which is under the, uh, under the control of the Ministry of Finance. Right. But things have a way of just moving aside. Right. It's basically just, okay, in the first instance, we're tackling private sector. We are not tackling government projects. So we were helping private owners, private individuals to work in culture and to work in conservation in the World Heritage Site. So having used that as an umbrella, everybody accepted that something had to be done in order to answer the brief of UNESCO. Right? So we sidestepped that issue. But in the process, people came, the, the local authority, for example, came to us with problems. said, help me solve this problem. And so we went into projects which helped the government solve problems. We never went against them because we never enter into a project on our own, which is either in opposition or in support of the government. We, we don't want to be seen. There has to be a mandate given to us. So in, in all the series of projects that involve government, we also ensured that it was a public-private partnership or there was an international partnership brokered together with the government so that it never seemed as if it was in opposition to because they came to us for help. We never went to them. So after we finished dispensing with the, the grants, um, Kazana itself came to us, the, the managing director of the Sovereign Fund said, since you did such a good job in Penang, you replicate it in four other geographies. So we said to them, okay, if we're going to do that, we need, we need money. So they turned to the foundation and we gave them a five-year plan and they made the funds available. And then because we were following the same method of engagement, we never hit uh, points where we did things that was against the government's uh, wishes or against the government's vision, per se. So, in a sense, it hasn't really. 
manage to spend the money in line... Oh, sorry. Uh, I missed the microphone. If I understand correctly, the strategy was, although you were working under the sovereign fund, yes. you made sure that this would, by having this kind of partnership that you mentioned with uh, foreigner institutions or local uh, private uh, developers or whatever, you will always be seen as a service provider, independent, and serving the best interests of the public. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we, we became known as a very uh, reliant delivery partner. That's, that's what they like to use the word in Malaysia. So we deliver results. So uh, as I said, you know, they, people are very, very lazy. They let you do the job and they take the credit. So there's never really... Uh, here is different. Don't they, uh, don't, they don't allow you to do the job. That's it. <laughs> Finish. No arguments. So it's a much different environment. Sure. <laughs> they, it's as simple as that. It's not a matter of being lazy. It's, they are just plain dumb. That's it. Okay. That's it. Okay. I never said this. You never okay. said that. Okay. okay. Um, any other... Question? When you said you form a partnership, does it mean there's a legal entity that you would form? Sometimes. So uh, then you would be responsible partially for the development and operation and maintenance uh, for the project? Yeah. Uh, case in point, I spoke about going into partnership with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. And I spoke about the big waterfront project. But how we brought them in is that they, they help us do the strategic master plan for the city. Right? And through a different lens. They had worked in historic cities all around Europe, Africa, you know, Middle Asia and things like that. So eventually, they, there was a buy-in by their management and by the Aga Khan himself. And so eventually, we actually got them to sit down with the government and with ourselves. And they said, why don't we formalize this? So the government actually set up something called the Georgetown Conservation and Development Corporation, GTCDC. I mean, it took me five years to get it right. And the government held 51%. Think City held 49%. And Aga Khan has two directors who fly in every three months from Geneva for board meetings. So it's a very unique international, local, public-private partnership. And it's a legal entity. And so all of us have areas of responsibility. But... We just stick to our stick to our roles, you know, and we when we do the job. So and if you explain this to anybody else, they'll say it's a weird relationship, completely weird. But it happened. And there are other partnerships like that, equally off the off the board, you know. So we take responsibility for what we do. Huh? Sorry, one more question. Can you just explain what is the the body, the dimension of, of that uh, structure? <clears throat> so to, to, to understand the structure, the different bodies, because it seems like you have a kind of um, multidisciplinary uh, team. Mm -hmm. And what is the dimension? Because it's quite technical in some yeah. aspect. Um. We decided we were going to have a maximum headcount of 50 pax people. So we have economists, we have researchers, we have architects. We don't have engineers, but we engage engineers. We have conservation experts. Um, 
And we have a lot of, lot of young graduates, which we work with. So basically, it's multidisciplinary, but where we lack the expertise, we collaborate. And so in many of the projects that we do, we actually have multiple people coming together. So, for example, if we need to do a real estate project, looking at the precinct, we bring in uh, very strong retail companies, you know, and they come in and they actually do the, do the sort of uh, ideas of how to do retail, what sort of people to bring in. Then we bring in sort of economists to tell us about um, what the cost and what the cost benefit and effects are, you know. So we set up a team. And then after that project's finished, we, we disband. <coughs> and that's where we... And that's deliberate because we want to be small and nimble, right? So not more than 50 in four geographies, so that's quite a lot of work, right? But we also have a communications department of two people who do all the communications to make sure that uh, it's in the right space, people are informed, people know what we're doing. It's really sort of also promoting the idea of transparency, right? And I can't figure it out how, how we manage to do so much. <coughs> okay. Um, I don't know if any other questions. Maybe we thank Professor Wong. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I have just a small announcement to make. Our next uh, lecture will be on 18 of May on the Art Garden, correct me if I'm wrong, with, uh, with the architect uh, Jing Jun from China. He's going to present some, uh, his work uh, on, about uh, creating a creatorship of uh, exhibitions, architectural exhibitions. So hope to see you there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.